Senator Romney, good to see you again. Thank you. That's good to see you. Am I on? You are indeed. We made you it work. Indeed. Okay. We're okay. together. You know, the last time that we sat down, you were Governor Romney. Uh, and it occurred to me as uh, you were waiting to take some votes before we started this conversation, there's a really big difference between being a governor and a senator. And I always wondered, having been a manager, having run things, having been an executive, how this all would sit with you. Um, because now you're one of a hundred, your schedule is at the mercy of someone else. Uh, how's it going? Uh, I enjoy the job. Uh, but it is a very different job. There's no question about that from being an executive in the business world to uh, uh, helping organize the Olympics and then having served as a governor. Uh, but I've had uh, different jobs over my career. Uh, I started at the bottom. Uh, I worked as a consultant for a number of years where you're not able to uh, basically do anything. You're hoping to convince other people <laughs> that they should take action. So there's a bit of that in the Senate. I think the most a uh, frustrating part of the job is that uh, over the years, the Senate has moved and moved to a point where I think there's a reluctance to vote on things that might be bad votes for members of the majority's party. So as a result, we don't vote in very much. Uh, we we uh, not either up or down things we agree with, but if it's bad for X, Y, or Z, Senator, why then, uh, then we don't wanna take that vote. So we vote very rarely on matters of substance. And just as a particular, um, I think in the two years I've been in the Senate, we haven't had a single vote on a matter relating to healthcare, immigration, um, tax policy, climate change, and the list goes on. So it's- yeah. um, As long as it's nothing it, important, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a challenge. Yeah, well, I mean, look, one of the frustrations that people have is they look at Washington and they see parties positioning themselves uh, to advantage themselves for the next election more than working together to try and solve problems. And we're in a particular moment right now. We're 16 days after an election. Um, I, I remember I was in the room in 2012 when you called President Obama to concede uh, the election. And four years later, Hillary Clinton called uh, Donald Trump uh, a few hours after the polls closed uh, er in the early morning hours of the next day. And the transition began almost immediately. Here we are 16 days later, and we're in a state of suspended animation. Um, and it's, it has consequences, doesn't it? Well, it certainly does. Uh, you know, I think uh, both here and around the world, uh, we are uh, seeing a reduction in the confidence we have in voting. And if people don't believe in voting and don't have confidence in voting, how can you have democracy? Because democracy is fundamentally based upon people voting. And if the United States of America uh, doesn't believe uh, that we have voting that's, uh, that's reliable, why, how can you expect a, a country that's just becoming a democracy to adopt this practice? Uh, and, and use it as the basis for determining its future. So yeah, this has, this has consequence here and it's consequence around the world. And we care about the world because uh, we, are, we are more prosperous as a nation and more able to enjoy peace if the world we trade with is prosperous and enjoying peace. So uh, you know, we're part of a, of a global system, whether we want to admit it or not, uh, America's success and America's prosperity and safety is related to what's happening in the world. Yeah, you you know, well, we should, uh, a little bit later, I wanna talk about that because those principles are very much, uh, you know, in contention uh, in our politics uh, today. But um, in the, just this morning, there was a Reuters poll that said 52% of Republicans uh, felt that the election was rigged and that uh, Trump was the rightful winner of the election. And that's a consequence of what the president himself has been saying right up until uh, this moment. And uh, that, that has consequences as well. If you're Joe Biden coming into office um, and a significant number of people in the country feel like you're not legitimate, um, that makes governing more uh, difficult, does it not? 
Well, I, I would presume it makes it more difficult for a president to unite the country if, if a large segment of the country feels that someone is illegitimate and has stolen something, why they're not likely to uh, reward uh, this individual with their trust. And if you don't trust the person who's the president of the United States when he or she uh, asks us to come together for some greater purpose, why uh, that means that we would not be able to do so. I mean, the idea was united we stand. Uh, and, uh, and so when, when President-elect Biden said he wants to bring the country together, uh, obviously that's a much more difficult task if many people feel he is not the legitimate president. Yeah, isn't that part of what the president is doing, though? Isn't isn't it a little bit subversive? Uh, I'm sure that you didn't. Um, it wasn't the greatest moment of your life when you had to pick up that phone and and concede an election. Uh, but um, there are responsibilities here. Uh, one of which is to see to it that there's a transition, which there is not right now. Uh, how much does that worry you? The fact that. Um, there is no presidential daily briefing, national security briefing for Biden. The fact that the coronavirus teams are not uh, coordinated. The fact that you guys are going to have to, you're going to have to vote on nominations of the president's uh, appointees. Uh, but the FBI background checks of these appointees can't begin because there's no formal transition process because the president won't allow it to move forward. Yeah, I, I do believe there there will be gaps, um, and uh, and that's unfortunate and unnecessary. It means people won't be able to get underway as quickly as they otherwise uh, would have. Um, I'm uh, uh, I'm convinced, however, that in many cases the um, the people that are managing, for instance, the distribution of the vaccine will stay in place and they will uh, carry on. Uh, and, and likewise, in other agencies of our government, there will be a continuation that that will not be significantly impacted by the lack of a, a, a formal transition. But I, I must admit that in this intervening period, I'm, I'm more concerned about the actions the president is taking uh, that relate to, uh, for instance, the firing of, of Chris Krebs, uh, who is responsible for overseeing the cybersecurity of our government systems. This is yeah. a guy who came from Microsoft. Uh, uh, you know, To attract someone like this for a fraction of the pay he was getting before, that's quite an accomplishment. So he, you know, he he has been guarding our systems. To fire him in the uh, in this this end of term is really a very dangerous thing. Not to mention what happens with regards to the Secretary of Defense, uh, decisions with regards to troops in Afghanistan. Yeah. The, these kinds of 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 items happening at the very end of the president's term, those give me even more concern than the, uh, the the gaps that may exist as a result of delayed transition. Yeah, we should point out that Krebs was fired after asserting that the election was was free and fair and not uh, tampered with, uh, which is important information for the American people because of what you said earlier, because people need to have confidence uh, in the election. The president took umbrage uh, that he said that, you know, I had John Bolton uh, on this uh, podcast um, not long ago and before the election. And he said his concern was less about what the president would do between when we were speaking in the election and what he would do after the election to the inauguration. And he forecast firings, uh, perhaps uh, military decisions and interventions uh, that would be unwise. Um, so we are there now. Uh, the president apparently was contemplating uh, with his aides the possibility of an attack on Iran. Uh, I was in the situation room uh, and heard briefings about what, you know, about because these topics come up all the time. You know, there are great consequences to these kinds of decisions. And not only is is he making them in a vacuum with a new team apparently but the incoming president doesn't is not read into any of these situations it, it seems very perilous I, you know i can't disagree with you um i i I, uh, I must admit that i think this president has tended during his entire term and his campaign campaigns actually 
to uh, to break norms, if you will. And frankly, that's one of the things some people like about him is that he doesn't do what is expected and he doesn't play by the rules uh, that we've played by for a couple hundred years plus. Uh, but I, I hope that we, we recognize as a uh, citizenry that some of these norms were established by the founders and by those that followed them, recognizing that they had significant uh, uh, impact and purpose. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I've spoken with some people outside our country and they're, they're alarmed because they, they wonder, can we trust America? Uh, and, uh, and, and I think it's understandable that when they see practices that normally have been employed by uh, the chief executive being uh, pushed aside, they wonder what's going to happen. So, for instance, the decision to, to withdraw troops from Afghanistan, we have some 40 uh, coalition members that are, also have troops there. For us to pull our troops out obviously puts our remaining troops in some danger, as well as their troops. And they wonder how, how do we deal in a coalition with the United States leading it if there is a decision taken on a precipitous basis with which we may or may not have been familiar uh, that puts our troops in jeopardy. So it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's the consequences of what's happening during this lame duck period, uh, I think are potentially more severe than the consequence associated with a, um, uh, a late transition process. And is there any recourse uh... First of all, is there any recourse for the Congress uh, to, to, to rein in some of the president's excesses in this period? And secondly, is there the will? Uh, because a lot of your colleagues don't want to acknowledge or haven't yet acknowledged, at least publicly, uh, that the election's over. Uh, and they, you know, there's a timidity about uh, taking the president on. Well, and I think also the fact that there's a, um, a Senate race in Georgia, which will determine uh, who's the majority leader and who are the chairs of all the committees and who instead are minor the minority leader and the ranking members of these committees, that has enormous consequence. And, and uh, President Trump could have a quite substantial impact on that election, either by uh, disparaging uh, the process in some way. Uh, or by uh, uh, supporting it and encouraging people to come out and vote for the Republican candidates. So um, irritating the president may not be uh, a, a, uh, <laughs> an easy decision for yeah. people that are concerned about that outcome. Yeah, there, there, but you can speak for, to this from a very personal standpoint. You, you cast maybe the most difficult vote anyone can cast uh, on the question of impeachment. Uh, and you voted for conviction, stood alone. Um, uh, and I, I just was wondering what, what the experience was like and what happened when you went home and when you, when you traveled around. And um, because the president, it's very costly um, to take this president on. He, he um, you know, he's not nuanced in his response. Yeah, I, I, I've been called a lot of names over the years, and I don't give that a lot of concern. Um, uh, I, I can tell you that uh, my, my biggest concern was making sure that, that what I was doing was right. Um, and uh, I don't think people all understand, but when we sit as a jury in an impeachment trial, we are sworn a new oath, or we swear a new oath, rather, and, and it is to act as a juror, if you will, to find a, a truth or uh, untruth. And, and so I took that responsibility very seriously. Uh, I did not want to be in that position. I did not want to be in a trial to convict or not convict the, the president uh, and the leader of my party. Uh, but I was thrust into that position. I took it seriously and reached the conclusion I felt was right. Uh, I, I, uh, I must admit, I was anxious about making sure I was making the right decision. That was the hardest part. And, and gathering the information, putting together my own timeline uh, to make sure that I had all the facts uh, uh, laid out in a way that, that was leading to, the, uh, to one conclusion or the other. Uh, once I de determined that there, he was in fact guilty as had been alleged by the House, uh, then the decision was relatively straightforward and the stress was reduced. Now, uh, I, I'm happy to report that, that while I expected to be um, uh, perhaps shunned by some. Well, some people talked about censuring you in back in Utah. 
Yeah, the the uh, the legislature looked at a vote to censure me or to actually try and remove me. There was an effort to say, will they remove me? So I, I, I realize there are very significant political consequences. I'm not terribly popular with my party uh, in the state of Utah. And uh, that's where I've got to run a primary and got to get reelected if I choose to run again. So, uh, but that consequence is nowhere near as great as the consequence of violating your own conscience. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I will say, I, I was pleased that I got a call from John Cornyn shortly after the vote. And he said, Nid, I want you to know, I would not want to be, be part of a group uh, that was uh, angry at someone because they voted their conscience. And, uh, and, and uh, Mitch McConnell likewise called me and, and, and offered the same, a similar message, uh, which was that, that uh, I should feel welcome in the caucus, uh, that, that he and others respect people who put their conscience. And I believe my colleagues did the same. You know, the, the, the thing that it underscores, though, you're, you're a kind of unique figure in many different ways um, in, in the Senate, um, one of which is you're, you're sort of an institution in your state. Um, it's clear that you know you're not you're not there as you know as a careerist uh, in the Senate, um, but I always and and you know you cast an incredibly uh, courageous vote. I'm always reminding people though there's a reason why profiles and courage was such a slim volume. Uh, <laughs> it's not the usual thing because part of being a politician is getting elected, and um, you know we saw. Just over the weekend, Mike DeWine, uh, the governor of Ohio, made a relatively benign comment that, you know, Biden is the president elect. And uh, the president immediately tweeted about finding a primary opponent for him uh, in Ohio. And the president leverages a lot of weight in the Republican Party. So these are kind of career decisions uh, for some of your colleagues. Uh, isn't that a big part of? in addition to Georgia, isn't that a big part of this? Uh, there's, there's no question, but that part of the calculation anyone makes uh, with regards to uh, votes and, uh, and what they say publicly, particularly what they say publicly and what they respond to and what they sort of let slide has to be uh, uh, whether uh, they might be replaced by someone who would be a, a, a lot less uh, a capable uh, and, uh, uh, and and less likely to follow their conscience than themselves. Uh, so uh, you know, I I, I, you know, I can't ascribe that to any particular individual or to all my colleagues as a group. I believe they each follow their conscience. But but uh, but certainly, uh, if one looks at, at at some of the primaries, you might say, "Oh my goodness, I I can't allow myself to get beat by that person because that would make our country in a." be put in a far weaker position. But, uh, but, but you must, in your private conversations, most of them must understand that the election's over, right? I think without question, people understand the election is over. Um, and they realize the president has a right to call for recounts and to pursue legal remedies. But at this stage, we haven't heard um, uh, any evidence of a widespread voter fraud effort that would result in a, a change of the outcome of the election. And no one's presented that, uh, that I know of. And of course, we're all watching with great interest, the entire country is. So at this stage, I think it's, it, it appears to be a foregone conclusion. Yeah. I mean, the, the place where, where the allegations are being made is mostly in the president's Twitter feed, uh, which goes to the point you made earlier about the corrosive effect of that. Uh, I mean, uh, Putin and uh, those, who, you know, our adversaries around the world who want to undermine American democracy, um, they must relish that. Well, I, I, uh, I'm surprised that, that there are as many people, as you say, that give it credibility, even within our own country, um, because the president said before the election that if he were to lose, it would be because of voter fraud. It would be because of corruption. Uh, and then on uh, a day or two after the election, when the vote was called by the major networks, uh, he indicated that there was massive fraud and that he had been robbed uh, of the victory. Uh, and that was before there was any evidence that had been gathered. So it, it's one thing to charge a crime. 
before you actually see any evidence. Normally you find evidence and then after seeing evidence, then you reach a conclusion about yeah. whether or not there was a crime committed. But, but I, you know, I, I understand the president is not happy with the result. He's entitled to pursue his legal remedies. Um, but, uh, but I think in all likelihood, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that, uh, that, that, he, that uh, uh, Joe Biden will become the next president. He's going to move his, uh, you know, uh, one thing, and you've said it, uh, and I agree with you that uh, he's not going away. Um, he's not one to uh, to sort of retire to Mar-a-Lago and silently consider his place in history. Uh, and he's, you know, apparently he's going to move his act down to Newsmax or somewhere. Uh, makes clear he's going to be active in in politics. Leadership pack maybe run again. Um, how how does that likely to affect um, the ability to find uh, pathways for cooperation when a new president takes office? Well, I think it really affects what's going to happen within my party. Um, and it's very hard for me to predict, obviously, accurately what the president is actually going to do uh, and what influence he will have on the party. My, my guess is he'll have a lot of influence. Uh, over primaries and over the, the party's policy going forward. But he may not. I see other people who predict that he will uh, you know, play a lot more golf and, and let bygones be bygones. I don't think that's in his nature no. uh, myself. So I think he'll continue to have a big, a big impact. Uh, I, I don't think he'll have a significant impact on legislation. And um, I, I may be wrong in that regard, uh, whether he continues to play a role in in, uh, in supporting or opposing uh, legislation that comes forward. I, I, I don't know whether that's uh, uh, something he will, uh, will find interesting and compelling. Uh, you know, that's not, been, that's not really been his modus operandi as a president. It's not that he comes up to the Hill and works on a piece of legislation or lays out a healthcare plan or an immigration plan. I mean, he, you know, he, he puts out various trial balloons to see how people react. Uh, but I, I don't know that he's he's likely to have a big influence on on the legislative, uh, uh, not only the legislative agenda, but the legislative accomplishment uh, uh, of Congress. But he he is uh, he does weaponize these issues where he thinks that they can benefit him and he uses them uh, to divide. And that would be uh, a concern if if cooperation becomes a, a test of uh, of loyalty. Let me ask you about this virus. Um, you know, when I asked you before about being a governor versus being a, a, a senator, uh, I'm sure you think from time to time, if I were a governor, what would I be doing now? Or if I were the executive, if I were president, what would I be doing uh, now? What, what, what should we have been doing or what should we be doing? Well, going back to the, uh, the origins of the, of the disease, um, it, it is my belief, and obviously other people don't agree with me, but it's my belief that, that in order to maintain the, the confidence and trust of the public, that it's important to level with the public uh, from the very beginning so that you maintain credibility. And therefore, when you ask the public to do something hard, they know that you're shooting straight. Uh, and, and apparently the president took a different point of view, which was that he didn't want to scare people. So even though he knew this was going to be serious and resulted in a lot of deaths, he was, he was going to minimize it initially. I, I think that uh, meant that he lost credibility. Uh, I, I also believe that from an organizational standpoint, that it was uh, a, a more appropriate approach, a more effective approach to respond the way I've watched other leaders respond when there's a crisis of some kind, which is to pull, uh, to pull in power to make executive decisions, and in this case, to have the federal government lay out a plan for distributing uh, PPE, uh, for distributing uh, medicines, for uh, all, all of the, the functions that, that states are really not well equipped to carry out without a, a coordinated national policy. Uh, and at this stage, it looks like we're moving in that direction. Uh, it, it looks like, and I, I think you have to uh, uh, tip the, the president and Congress's hand and say, well done for the the, the warp speed uh, mm -hmm. development of vaccine. Basically, that idea was we're going to we're going to pay up front pharmaceutical companies for uh, for vaccines, which may or may not work. So they'll spend the money necessary to test yeah. them and to manufacture them. 
And, uh, and so that, that looks like that, that's been a good approach from what, what we can tell. And, uh, and as, uh, as, as I can see from the outside, being organized relatively well to get this vaccine out into the states and to get it distributed to individuals. But there's a lot of work to, to happen between now and then. And one of the things we need to do is get funding to states to make sure they have the resources to do the distribution uh, and the inoculations that people are going to need. Do you, um, we, we're, it looks like we're entering a really dire stretch here before the light at the end of the tunnel when the vaccine arrives and is distributed. I mean, we see just horrific uh, statistics and stories from around the country right now and, um, and real pa uh, panic on the part of medical uh, administrators about the capacity of the healthcare uh, system. So we're sort of back to where we were at the worst part of this and maybe worse. Um, do you think that Congress can, will uh, come together here on a stimulus plan? And how, how important do you think it is that they do right now? Well, I, I actually wish that we could have an immediate uh, passage of a, uh, a, a vaccine distribution uh, program uh, that allows us to provide funding to states so they can be in a place to get the vaccine out as quickly as possible. I, I do that right, right away. But if we have to wait to put together a grant package, an omnibus package of some kind, which is entirely possible, and it, by the way, this may be connected to an omnibus budget bill. Uh, oftentimes things move, as you know, in yeah. large bundles. Right. Uh, and, and that may be the way to get things across the finish line. But um, I, I believe that we're not far apart on a whole host of areas relating to a, a, a next uh, uh, COVID relief package. So I think we're not far apart with regards to the PPP program for small businesses, uh, with regards to unemployment insurance. I think we're close uh, funding for hospitals and, uh, and, and education institutions. We're very close uh, providing support for airlines, uh, perhaps for transit as well. I think we're close. Um, the place where we're further apart uh, relates to should we uh, devote hundreds of billions of dollars uh, for states and localities. And I think one of the reasons you're seeing such a gap there is that you're finding senators from some states, like my state, where they say, we don't need any additional money. We're doing just fine. We have a rainy day fund that's going to meet our shortfall. That's why we have a rainy day fund. So you don't need to send us more money. Uh, and, and so you have other states that say, oh boy, we've got a huge problem. You've got to give us money or we're going to have to start laying off people. So you've got very different perspectives to different senators. And uh, so coming together on that front may, uh, may, may be more difficult. And I think that's why it's been so hard to reach an agreement so far, which is not so much what's the scale of the, uh, of the relief going to be as to where the money is going to go. And, and a number of people, uh, Republicans in my caucus, feel that this is an effort on the part of the Democrats to get money to New York and California and Illinois and other states that have massive uh, pension liabilities. Uh, it's a, a way to solve their problems. And, and the other states that don't have those problems say, no, 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 that's not fair. So we're still far apart on the state Isn't side. Isn't that, but uh, just put your governor hat on for a second. Um, states have had extraordinary outlays as a result of this virus and depressed revenues now for eight months or more. It's, it's about to get worse. Th these are real problems for the states and localities. They're not, uh, I mean, they may be different in severity from place to place, but it seems like a a national problem that is, is a result of this, uh, you know, pension notwithstanding, these are burdens uh, on these states and communities, um, are they not? And, and they are. And the, the first COVID bill, as you know, uh, provided $150 billion to states and localities. It was directed to have uh, a reimbursement fund for their out-of-pocket expenses associated with responding to COVID. Uh, and, and a good portion of that money has not been taken up yet because the, the costs of, of treating COVID at the state level were not as great as might have been anticipated. But the other portion that you described is a gap in revenue. And, uh, and states say, hey, we'd like the federal government to make up for that gap in revenue. And that's the point I was making in that there are a number of states represented by Republicans, not all of them, obviously, but by a number of Republicans, particularly in the Intermountain West and, and, and the North Central portions of the country, 
where the states are doing fine in revenue and where they have a very small gap. Uh, and so they're saying, gee, why should we be part of a borrowing program to help those states that are, uh, uh, they feel mismanaged. Now, I, 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 I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna get into the, the, the argument that they make. Uh, I happen to agree that, uh, that, that a revenue gap is very different than a spending problem. Uh, but uh, uh, there are a number of proposals that are going around. I think uh, Governor Baker of Massachusetts has suggested that perhaps we should uh, increase the amount of federal funding on Medicaid, and that would free up funds for states to be able to meet their needs. Uh, I've suggested another alternative, which is to have the states and localities uh, apply for, for relief in the same way the PPP program did, which is if you had a substantial gap in your revenue, come provide that to the Treasury Department, and the federal government will make up, let's say, 50% or 60% or whatever the number might be of that gap. Uh, and the states that have a, a gap would come in asking for those funds. So there are ideas out there. Hopefully, we can bridge the divide and get something done before the end of the year. Um, why has mask wearing been become such a political uh, issue? I, I understand people's frustration. I'm sure you hear it all the time about the limitations that the virus has placed on their ability to make a living and so on. I'm struck all the time that we can, most of us can do, uh, who, who are opining on this, do it from the comfort of our own homes. And a lot of people don't have that luxury. And a lot of people are living from paycheck to paycheck or under enormous pressure uh, because of this. But mask wearing seems like a very sensible way to try and reduce the exposure. We know that it works. Um, why has it become such an emblem uh, for, for particularly for conservatives, uh, you know, over this, this last many months? And to be truthful, David, it's beyond me. I simply can't imagine uh, why there have been people, primarily in my party, that have politicized wearing masks. It just doesn't make sense to me. Because the, the president, for instance, his best chance of getting reelected was for the COVID crisis to be behind us and for the economy to be you know, doing superbly well. The only real effective tool he had was to get people to all wear masks. And yet by his own actions, he made it seem like that was not a, 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 a politically uh, appropriate thing to do in some cases. And uh, so he was in some respects working counter purpose. Uh, and, and of course, the health consequence uh, could be enormous. You know, it, it's true that there's no there's no one uh, action that we can take that stops COVID-19. Uh, I think someone has described it as a, a, a series of slices of Swiss cheese, which is there are holes through all the vehicles we have to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Masks are not 100% effective. Uh, social distancing is certainly not 100% effective. Uh, and, and the list goes on. And the vaccine will not be 100% effective. But if you do all of them, if you take all of those steps, why then you really do dramatically reduce the likelihood that you're going to get COVID-19 and you reduce the, the, the spread that might occur by people receiving it. So I, 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 you know, I, I can tell you that, that the, the new media, meaning social media, has, has allowed for the spread of conspiracies that, uh, that include wearing masks uh, will also, I'm sure, mean that some people won't get vaccinated because yeah, there'll be conspiracies. Of, yeah, mm -hmm. conspiracies about vaccination. I mean, there are all these conspiracies out there. And, um, uh, you know, it, it, it becomes like a wildfire. People, for some reason, we have a natural tendency to want to believe that people who are expert, the people in charge, are really lying to us. And the only people that are telling us the truth are the neighbor down the street who has no expertise at all? Uh, it's a very, it's a very strange phenomenon. Yeah, you um, uh, during the midst of this, we also had the um, the George Floyd killing and the social justice marches, and you joined one apparently, sort of spontaneously and organically. You 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 fell in with a group of evangelicals who were marching in Washington. Uh, in one of these social justice marches, uh, Black Lives Matter marches. Tell me about that, how that came about and why you felt compelled to, uh, to join. 
Well, I had actually, it was just a Sunday. I'd actually driven uh, from New Hampshire where I had been uh, that weekend. We have a home there. I'd driven down and I got in, I don't know, four or five o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, I, I heard that there was a, a group gathering outside the Capitol uh, to support the Black Lives Matter uh, message. And um, so I, I just walked over to the Capitol. It's very close to my home. Walked over to the Capitol and uh, and was able to march with those people as they marched marched from the Capitol to the White House. Uh, and um, it, it's pretty straightforward for me. Black Lives Matter is a statement saying that we have a justice system and a law enforcement system which, from time to time, uh, uh, d does not exercise uh, equal and fair justice. Uh, and that that's a that's an important message. We want to make it very clear that law enforcement. Uh, as well as other uh, parts of our uh, justice system, should be colorblind uh, and should not be discriminatory against people uh, of color. I, I happen to have a, an African American grandson. I, uh, you know, I understand that there is so-called the talk, where parents talk to a child about the discrimination that might exist because of the color of their skin. I don't know how this grandson of mine will be able to understand that. And understand why is it that that I will be treated differently than my siblings and than my cousins simply because my the pigment of my skin is different, and and I find that very troubling. Now now I know some people say well but how about the Black Lives Matter organization? Do you subscribe to their manifesto? It's like well, I, I haven't even seen their manifesto. I, I don't worry about that organization. A lot of people try and take credit for movements, but the movement that draw drew out millions of people here and around the world was a very simple movement, which is we want to see more racial justice. We want there to be less discrimination. We want to stand with our black friends to say, yeah, your lives do matter. You come by this uh, naturally. I, you and I have had this discussion before. I grew up as a young kid and one of my political heroes was actually your dad, though I grew up in a democratic family because uh, he courageously stood up for civil rights in the 1960s as governor of Michigan, uh, he participated in marches then. Uh, and I wonder uh, how much he was on your mind uh, during these marches. I also wonder how much he's been on your mind during some of these political battles that you fought because your, your father was famously uh, at odds with the leadership of his own party at times, not just you know on civil rights, but other issues um and often stood alone and i was wondering whether he plays on your mind as you make these decisions there, there's no question but that who i am and and what little courage i have uh it is the result to a large measure uh, of of having watched my my dad exercise courage of his own um uh, people feel that that uh, that uh, that what he did was courageous uh, that what he did showed a, a degree of integrity. Uh, and those things, by the way, only have value if there's a cost associated with, with them, uh, with exercising them. And, um, and so I saw my dad uh, make decisions which were politically uh, uncomfortable and, uh, and which had consequence for him. But uh, I saw that and saw that he was happy and satisfied because of it. I remember one time uh, my, my wife and my dad were, were driving in Boston and the radio came on and said that Bob McNamara, formerly the Secretary yeah. of Defense under Lyndon Johnson, Bob McNamara had said that in fact, he had lied uh, to the American people about the deaths in Vietnam and about the Vietnam War. And that came on the radio. And my, uh, my wife uh, turned to my dad who had accused the Johnson administration of lying and said, you know, uh, you know, George, Dad, uh, you know, doesn't that make you feel good? Do you, I mean, to hear that he's finally admitted? Because by the way, McNamara had said about my dad, George Romney wouldn't know the truth if it hit him in the face. Yeah, so, we should point so out for wife, those who don't know the history that he spoke out against the war in 1967, and he was in the midst of perhaps running for president. It cost him, you know, really basically cost him his political career. Uh, yeah, yeah. He served in the cabinet after that, but but that was it. And so that's the context in which you're telling the story. Yeah. So my 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 wife said, you know, doesn't that make you feel good? And and he turned to her and he said, I never look back. 
I only look forward. Why would I look back? It's very interesting. I mean, he, he was not troubled by the, the consequence of doing what he felt was right. And, uh, and I'm sure that that influenced uh, and influences how I think about my life. We're all influenced by our parents. And, and I, I have a, a picture of my dad um, marching in Detroit with, uh, for a civil rights cause. I don't know who the people are in the picture besides himself. There are a couple of people of color there, a number of people of color, a few others. And uh, no question, uh, he was governor at the time. So he was at the front of the parade. And, and I recognized, I'm not governor uh, in, the, in the march that we had in Washington. I was just back with all the other folks, which I was perfectly comfortable with. But I did think about him. And, uh, and my, my recollection is he marched more than once for civil rights. And, uh, and that time for a Republican governor to be leading in civil rights was, was more unusual than even it is today. I wanna ask you real, really quickly about um, the Supreme Court vote that you took for Justice Barrett. Um, I, I'm one who believes that if Democrats had the, choice, had the option and were in, a, in that same position, probably would have wanted to move forward on that nomination, because as you have pointed out, that is within the authority of the president. The thing that outraged people, as you know, was that that wasn't the principle that was applied uh, four years earlier uh, when um, uh, Justice Gar Judge Garland never got a hearing, President Obama's choice, for almost a full year uh, after Justice Scalia died. It took 400 days to fill that seat. Um, you can appreciate that sense of, of, I guess, hypocrisy, can't you? Oh, certainly. And, and, and certainly individuals, uh, you know, Susan Collins, for instance, she said, uh, she said that she uh, uh, would not support uh, Judge Garland because it was an election year. And she said, I think, in August of this year that she would not support a, a Trump nominee if it were to occur uh, during that year. And she uh, was consistent with that in her, in her vote. I hope that had I said similar things in the past that I would have had the courage that Susan Collins demonstrated. Uh, I was of course not there at that time, but I understand why people uh, feel that uh, one argument was made at one time and it was not abided by the second time. Uh, I came into the Senate, of course, not having made statements of that nature and looked at the very simple fact that the constitution gives the president the right to make a nomination and the Senate to accept or reject. Uh, that the Senate in the past, the senators, in my view, would have been a lot wiser just to say, uh, you know, we'll give this man a hearing, but we're not planning on confirming him uh, because we want a person uh, th that conforms to our political philosophy. That would have been a wiser thing to say, because, of course, there have been many times, even during election years, when presidents have put forward a nominee, if, uh, if the Senate is not in their party's hands, why the nominee gets turned down. So that's not unusual, but the, the logic that was given at the time I think uh, uh, was not applied uh, in the in the current circumstance, and for those people, I think uh, they have to explain that. Yeah, it just uh, those things uh, are among the things that erode people's confidence in these democratic institutions uh, of ours. Uh, let me ask you um, as we go out: you've got a large, uh, beautiful family. Uh, how many grandkids do you have? 25. 25. Okay, so that's a baseball team right there. Are you, uh, are, what, what are you thinking about Thanksgiving? Everybody's worried about uh, what they should do on Thanksgiving. Are you going to be able to get together with your family? Are you going to forego that? Have you had those discussions? Uh, we've had those discussions and we are all being very careful. Uh, we recognize that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's a vaccine light. And it would be foolish for us to take um, uh, relaxation of, 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 of the efforts we've been carrying out for these past many months uh, and to get COVID now. Uh, I have a son uh, who actually had COVID. He had a, uh, his daughter came home from high school with it. They didn't know she had it. It spread through his family. So my son, his wife, and all of his mm -hmm. children got it. So we'll be having Thanksgiving dinner with them <laughs> because mm -hmm. they've all had it. They can't give it to us. We can't give it to them. Uh, but that's the only uh, son we'll be and, and and group of grandkids we'll be having uh, Thanksgiving dinner with. So we're we're staying safe, David. Hope yeah. you do too. Yeah, yeah. No, it's listen. We're agonized about it, but uh, totally. Um, you know, you got to take the long 
you got to take the long view here. Um, I just want to say before we go, uh, something that I say behind your back, uh, which is this. Um, I, I played some small role in thwarting your campaign in 2012. Um, and uh, eight months later, you invited my wife, Susan, and me to come and talk to a group of your um, supporters uh, at a conference, not about politics, but about epilepsy, which has plagued my daughter's life. And um, we, you, we got a wonderful reception, um, great support, um, but it also told me something about you uh, and your humanity. And um, I like to tell that story because it's so important in politics to remember that even if we have different views, we share a common humanity and we have to see that in each other. But for someone who had run for president to invite the strategist for the other guy to come and talk um, was moving to me, um, gave me hope. Uh, and um, and deep appreciation for you as a person. So I wanted to take the opportunity to say that to you because I do say it behind your back. I want to say it in front of you. <laughs> Thank you, David. You're you're very kind. And uh, you know, I, I have learned that people who who are my political adversaries, uh, nevertheless, uh, without exception so far, are people who love the country like I do, uh, and and want to see a future for the American people just like I want to see. And, and so while we're in competition with one another, we can, we can be ferocious and, and aggressive and, and, and use our, our full energy, but we're, on the, we're, we're fighting for the same purpose uh, when all is said and done. And uh, you know, I, I, you know, I ran against Ted Kennedy once. Uh, I disagreed with him on a whole host of policies, but we worked together when I became governor, we became collaborators on my health care plan and on several other economic development initiatives. Uh, and we became friends. Uh, so, uh, you know, we should, those of us who disagree with one another should spend more time listening to one another and establishing the kind of rapport that allows us to learn from one another. And uh, I appreciate the, the chance I've had to learn from you. Uh, not just in our, yeah. our in meeting in, in Utah, but also uh, watching you on a CNN on election night and the next day and the next day. <laughs> <laughs> election week, we call it now. Yeah, election week, uh, that was no, most I, informative. I, I appreciate it. Well, I, I hope that um, the ideal that you lay out um, is one that survives this particularly ugly period in our history and survives the onslaught of social media and disinformation and because at the end of the day, democracy kind of relies on that uh, and the ability to find ways to move forward together, even when we disagree uh, on maybe many other things uh, and, to, uh, and to respect each other as, as, as human beings. So uh, for that reason and many others, I'm so appreciative that you're here today. Thanks, Senator Romney. Thank you. Now, um, now we go to questions. Uh, you graciously, I don't know if you knew this, but you've graciously <laughs> agreed to take some questions from students. Um, and uh, the first one is from Christos, who's a third year student in the college. Christos. Hi there, Senator Romney. Uh, Hi, Christos. Let me just say what a pleasure it is to be able to ask this question. Um, I, was, I was just wondering, um, my parents almost romantically talk about the 90s as a time of like compromise specifically with regard to the national debt. Um, given that you mentioned it in your 2012 campaign, I was just wondering if you think that that's something that could be prioritized if the House and the Senate are split um, after Biden becomes president? I actually think that, that our prospects for dealing with the amount of the national debt would be uh, improved if there is a division of government between Democrats in the House and Republicans in the Senate, because I think the only way we're going to deal with the, the debt problem we have and the annual deficits that keep adding to the debt is if there's a bipartisan effort, bipartisan, bicameral. Uh, and, and I think if we have, if you will, the same kind of effort that was uh, undertaken with Simpson-Bowles, 
where we get a group of people, and in this case, I'd have only elected officials, but we have people from both sides of the aisle appointed by leaders in, uh, in both chambers and have them work, I think best looking entitlement by entitlement, uh, because as you probably know, that the spending that we have is overwhelmingly on entitlements. And that's where we have, in Republicans view, they say we need to deal with uh, the, the, the size of the benefits and Democrats view it's no, we need to get more revenue, but we gotta find some answer uh, because two thirds of federal spending is not voted on every year. Two thirds of federal spending is automatic. It's our so-called entitlements. And so we're gonna have to look at that. And I think, I think a bipartisan effort would be enhanced with divided government. I don't know where a, a President Biden would be uh, with regards to that effort, but my guess is he'd say, you know, more power to you guys. And if you can come up with a solution that passes both houses with 60 votes in the Senate and, and a bipartisan support, why that would be something he would be inclined to sign. I sure hope so. Thanks, Chris. Let me just ask, ask a, a quick follow-up on that. Do you, uh, we've, we've seen this yawning gap um, in, uh, in, in income and, and, and wealth. Uh, that's a consequence of the changing nature of our economy. Um, and uh, a big concern about retirement security and so on. Do you think that, uh, would you be open to uh, as part of such a plan, more revenues coming from upper income earners uh, to help bolster these retirement programs and perhaps enhance uh, uh, the benefits to give retirees a little more security? Well, I think there's no question, but that, that the relief relating to entitlements is going to primarily or, or significantly come from upper income earners. And whether that's through higher uh, uh, taxes, which I would not be inclined toward, or lower benefits for higher income people, or perhaps no benefits for higher income people. Uh, th they're going to have to participate in a significant way in, in uh, solving this issue. But if we were to put together a bipartisan uh, uh, commission of some kind, why it's going to have to mean everything is on, on the table. I, I do believe that the best way we can reduce income inequality is not figuring out a way to get Warren Buffett to, you know, to have a, a billion dollars knocked off his uh, uh, his balance sheet, but instead to raise the incomes of people at the lower end, and and so I'm one of those that has long argued for increasing the minimum wage, and linking it with inflation, so that it continues to go up at a regular basis and a predictable basis, so that individuals know they're going to keep up with inflation, and so that businesses don't get hit by big jumps every now and then, but instead they see a predictable path. So. I, I'd like to find ways to help lower income families. I'd like to find a way to provide more tax credits to people with kids, with children, because children are expensive to raise. I want family formation and, and birth. So, uh, I, you know, I, I, uh, I'm a little different than perhaps the average Republican in that regard, but I'm looking for help for lower income families uh, and, and working families. I want to see their incomes get better. Great. Anna, you want to step up? Anna Katz, who's a uh, a college and I get the class of 24. Great. Hi, Senator Romney. Thank you for taking Hi, my Anna. question. I'm a first year here in the college. I was in fifth grade when you ran your presidential campaign and one element of your platform that I remember was your emphasis on Russian foreign policy. Given all that has happened with election meddling and increased aggression towards dissidents like Alexei Navalny, what foreign policy position do you think the next administration should take towards Russia? Well, I think I think uh, the next president recognizes that Russia is a malign actor, uh, and and that they are uh, intent on thwarting our initiatives everywhere and anywhere in the world. Uh, Russia has, in some respects, sort of joined forces with China and is promoting authoritarianism and trying to uh, uh, discredit uh, democracy. And, and that's to make the world easier for them to trade in. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, that's not in our advantage. So they will be a geopolitical uh, competitor and adversary, if you will. That doesn't mean we're going to go to war with Russia by any means. But I think we have to be clear eyed that, that for a long time, they have been the, uh, the most visible player on the global stage trying to push back against us, to vote against us at the United Nations. They support the world's worst actors, the, the dictators, and so forth. But, but if I were to say today, 
what's the greatest geopolitical challenge that we have, it would not be Russia, it would be China. Uh, and, uh, and that's because China is on a pathway to surpass us economically, uh, to surpass us economically, uh, militarily, excuse me, as well, uh, and geopolitically. And, and so um, uh, how we deal with a, a, a China intent on becoming the world's superpower, the hyperpower, uh, and putting us in the rearview mirror is something we're going to have to deal with. Uh, and, and they do that uh, in, in ways that are subtle, uh, but predatory. So uh, the president-elect has some real challenges. Yes, he's got to be uh, clear-eyed about, about Russia but he's also gonna to have to develop a, a strategy, which I happen to think needs to be a global in dimension, meaning we have to align with our allies to exert pressure on China to divert them from their current course and to get them to start playing by the rules. Uh, we can't, I don't believe we can do that alone. I, I, think the president, I think President Trump was right to push on China and to call him out as he did, but I think he was wrong in not collecting other nations of like mind to join him in that effort. Thanks, uh, Anna. Um, Charlie, you get the last question. First year in the college. Hello, Senator Romney. Uh, I'm Charlie, first year in the college. My question is, uh, we have begun to live in a very partisan world where we have seen things that have, be, uh, that have come up for debate that had never been up for debate in the past. It's clear that our the fabric of our democracy needs some common sense of what the truth is. How do we get not only our politicians, but our everyday Americans to step in partisan politics and try to reach some common sense of the truth? Uh, I wish I had a better answer for that than I do, um, uh, because I'm concerned, uh, as you are, uh, as the nation is dividing more and more. Uh, and, and there are many reasons for that. I'm sure you've, you've studied them at the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago um, in, in some depth. Uh, and, and reversing that course is, uh, is a difficult uh, challenge. And I don't know how to do it, but I can tell you, uh, my experience in looking at history is that in nations that have begun to be uh, uh, sick in one way or another, um, uh, that, that there have been two, two types of events which have allowed them to recover uh, on a pathway of success and greatness. One is they encounter a crisis that's so severe it wakes the people up, but it's not so severe that it kills, the, <laughs> it kills the host, it kills the country or the civilization. The other is uh, a, a leader of unusual capability who is able to uh, help the people uh, draw upon, if you will, their better angels. And, uh, and that's a Winston Churchill that frankly saved the world from, uh, from totalitarian rule from, from Hitler. Uh, it is, uh, a, uh, uh, in my view, someone like, uh, well, certainly an Abraham Lincoln, who following, followed a devastating division of our country, uh, spoke about malice towards none and charity towards all, and, and set the tone. Had he been able to stay as president, he would have been able to carry that out more fully but he certainly set the tone that many hopefully followed. So there are people of, of extraordinary stature that are able to do that. I, I have, throughout my career, I have come to recognize the extraordinary significance of individuals of goodwill, uh, particularly those that are in the top leadership positions, but even those in some cases who are not the top leaders, whether it's a Nelson Mandela from prison, whether uh, there, there, are, there are individuals who, who have outsized influence by virtue of their, their genuine goodness, their humility, but their absolute commitment to enduring principles. So you know, I hope we find that in a president-elect Biden and the team he assembles, but I also hope that we find in leaders of all kinds, leaders in homes, in schools, in churches, uh, the same kind of, of insistence upon uh, enduring principles uh, of comity and and uh, and respect. Uh, there, there's a great uh, social scientist who has for many years led the American Enterprise Institute, uh, and uh, uh, he he makes the point that that love is at the fund foundation of all good things, and and uh, appreciating a sense of love for our fellow Americans and for people around the world uh, is, I think, at the heart of of what it'll take to bring us together. 
Thanks, uh, Charlie, and and thanks, Senator. Yeah, and, I, and and to Charlie's point, everything you said, Senator, is right, uh, and Charlie's concern is right as well, which is that fidelity to facts and truth are important. We can disagree on what to do about climate change, but climate change is a fact. We can disagree about how to handle the virus, um, but there are certain immutable truths about the virus, and you know, when we don't recognize those uh, is when it gets very, very difficult. Um, so let's, let's try and agree on a common set of facts and then figure out what to do about uh, the challenges that we face. And uh, that, that would be nice, David. It would be nice if, if we could do that. There were, once upon a time, we had three networks we all watched. And so we got, all got the same facts. Uh, now people are watching uh, a, a news feed, which is cur curated for them uh, to, to show them things they like to, to see. Yeah. And, uh, and so we're not getting the same facts. And in many cases, we're getting things that are not facts. And it's led to explosion of conspiracy theories. And, and they can be dangerous in terms of dividing our country and, and, and um, impairing our national health. Yeah. Pat Moynihan once said you can have your own, your, your own opinion, but you can't have your own facts. Today, you can have your own facts because you can surround yourself in a virtual reality silo and where your views are affirmed, but not necessarily informed and everybody outside is alien. And we've got to find a way to defeat that. Um, and it's a big challenge. But um, it certainly is. Well, let us make that a common cause as well. Thanks, Senator Romney. Thank you for your generosity to me personally, but thank you for your generosity to the Institute of Politics. You've, you've been there for us many times now, and uh, both as an example um, and as a participant. So we appreciate it. Thank you, David. Good to be with you today. Great Take to care. see you. Happy holidays. Thank you. You too.